Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Breaking Bread series uh, with some amazing folks who are joining us today. My name is Cindy Nava, and I am part of uh, Georgine team, uh, the Georgine Lewis team, and we are just thrilled to be here with you. I am very honored to share the stage with, with these amazing women that are joining us today. Um, just housekeeping notes, we will have the Q&A open for folks to submit questions. Um, it, the entire webinar will go on for 45 minutes, um, and we will try to get through as many questions as we can. We already had questions submitted upon registration. So just please do keep that in mind. And if there are questions that we don't get to, um, feel free to just send them over via email. Um, our, our colleague Alejandro will be typing in um, to make sure that you have that information as well. But again, I'm Cindy Nava and I come from, I am, a woman from an immigrant background. I am a former DACA recipient and I feel incredibly lucky to get to share a space with this woman who is now running for Congress. There are many reasons for which I stand with Georgine, but as somebody who has worked in the leadership space um, through different sectors and who understands the complexities that women of color face, um, I feel incredibly passionate about making sure that we elect a woman who not only understands the policy and the legislative background and has that experience, but somebody who brings a story to the table that resembles those, those stories of our New Mexico and of our New Mexicans. Um, and somebody who will carry on the work that our dear Deb Holland essentially laid the ground for. So we are just, I'm honored and I am thrilled to be here with you all. I. I'm thrilled to be part of Georgine's team. And as an immigrant, como hija de migrantes, I am so proud to join this woman on her bid to Congress. And I just invite all of you to join our campaign and get behind Georgine because she is an overly qualified woman who is so incredibly humble that will not, that's not something that she says herself, but I will tell you because I've worked with her side by side for many years. And I've seen it in action behind the scenes, in front of the scenes. The Georgine that you meet right now is the same Georgine that you meet behind any, any, any scenes. And she's ready to work. She's ready to get to, to Congress and pass those things that were, are essentially there um, to make sure that she carries that torch that Deb left for, for us to, to follow. But with that said, please help me welcome Representative Georgine Lewis our candidate for Congressional District 1. Great, thank you, Cindy, for that lovely introduction. I'm so touched. Kawatsi, uh, Halpa, I hope everyone is doing really well tonight. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I'm incredibly fortunate to have um, not only Brandy and Jessica joining, but also Cindy as well. I mean, I think we should include her because these are young women of color that I know will be our next leaders and will be doing fantastic things in the future. They're already doing fantastic things now, but I look forward to like the multiplication of that very, very soon. <laughs> So I, I just want to say a few things, um, you know, Cindy is fantastic. So, you know, I'm incredibly proud of her. I'm so happy that she's now an American citizen and um, she has a great resume and we didn't include her in, in this conversation as far as her bio goes, <laughs> but I'm glad she's joining us um, because again, I know um, she's going to look, do some tremendously um, significant things. Um, so I don't have your, your bio, Cindy, but um, yeah, I think the world of you. <laughs> there is no need. Thank, <laughs> thank, you. thank you, thank you. No, and I think something that's very important to just kind of tie in um, from that angle that I've essentially come from, Georgine, is that as an immigrant, as somebody who was not able to be in a lot of places and spaces um, within the policymaking process, um, I am grateful to have women like you who are willing to open up those doors and to go far and beyond to make sure that you're outreaching to those communities and that you are a trusted ally. So thank you for having me. 
Thank you. And I, I do think we have a, a great representation of the community here. Um, Jessica Martinez is joining us. Thank you, Jessica. Um, she is the editor in chief of the Tribal Law Journal and a former national LULAC youth president. So um, I know you, LULAC does some fantastic things, um, not firsthand, but I do know firsthand about the Tribal Law Journal. So I'm glad you're uh, carrying that torch and, and being there. But a little bit about Jessica. She's a board member of the National LULAC Women's Commission. She's a third year law student and dual degree candidate at the University of New Mexico School of Law and the School of Public Administration. I just think that's so fantastic. She's pursuing her Indian law certificate. And um, what's super incredible is that Jessica has been a LULAC volunteer for 16 years and was um, has been elected to positions locally and nationally. She's also a member of the um, Warm Springs Band of Chiricahua Apaches, and she's currently the tribal parliamentarian. Um, so congratulations, Jessica. Uh, so many, so many things to say about her. Um, thank you for joining us. Brandy Stone is uh, African American Student Services Advocate, Higher Education and Community Leader. Brandy is serving as the director of the African American Student services and special advisor to the president for African-American affairs at the University of New Mexico. So we have a couple of great global women here. <laughs> uh, her passion is creating a community uh, inclusive of black student scholars and cultivating a culture of black excellence. So she also serves as a national board member for the Association of Black Culture Centers where she is responsible for communicating the unique needs of Black students in the Southwest region and assisting in the development of shared standards for BCC at the national level. So we're happy to have both of you joining, joining us today. Again, I think you know, you've already done some incredible things and I'm looking forward to um, doing some incredible things, partnering and, and getting, getting stuff done. So thank you for, for joining us. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you so much. I'm super excited to be a part of this conversation. Great, thank you. And we've actually um, provided some time for both of you to provide some opening remarks. So uh, Brandy, would you like to go first? Um, yes, yeah, so I want to thank you, Representative Georgine. I actually don't even know like what is the most appropriate title to call somebody who's running for. <laughs> for <Georgine. office. laughs> so I, I want to thank you and I have deep gratitude to Cindy. Um, just a fun fact, like when we were all, this kind of feels like a college reunion. And, um, and when we're talking about women of color, like Cindy actually reached out to me in my junior, senior year of college and was like, hey, I think you'd be good running for ASUNM Senate, which is just like college student government. And she was our campaign manager and she was awesome. And she got like most of us in and it was a platform of just students of color. And so it's really exciting to come back into this space. And Georgine, I I love your priorities about working families and free childcare. And obviously I'm a higher education advocate. So I love everything you have to say about education and especially pre-K investment. Um, and I just, I think that you just have an authentic uh, your energy is just so authentic. And so I'm really excited to be in this space with you. Thank you. So happy to have you joining us. Jessica? Yeah, so um, as you said, you know, I've been involved for a really long time, like since I was like, I was about 14 years old when I got involved with LULAC. And, you know, a lot of people don't realize that no matter how old you are, you can get involved in your community, you can get involved in things that you're passionate about, you know, people assume like, oh, you have to wait, you know, wait, 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 but it doesn't matter how old you are, people can get, you know, involved. And I was so frustrated seeing, uh, growing up in a border town, you know, also growing up in a mixed status home. And, you know, my mother, you know, doesn't speak English too well, she speaks Spanish, she's she immigrated from Morelia, Michoacan as an undocumented immigrant. I have family members who are undocumented. 
Um, and so understanding that I had some level of privilege um, was really hard to grasp at a young age that why, you know, why do I have rights that my mother necessarily didn't or family members didn't have. And, um, you know, at the time also, you know, th there was a, there was a lot of xenophobic rhetoric going on when I was young. And so I got involved in, in LULAC because I felt that it was an organization that was involved at the, not only the grassroots level, but nationally. And um, through that, I've been able to see so many women um, of color, you know, becoming activists and getting involved in, in, you know, contributing to the larger movement. But the sad part is, is that many of us don't run for office. We, we, we stay involved because we're passionate, but a lot of us are too afraid to get involved on in a political level because there's a lot of, you know, there's, there's a lot of reasons behind it, but a, a lot of it does come from the fact that, you know, this, this society doesn't, doesn't give us the space and doesn't doesn't validate us as um, as competent, and that's and, and it's unfortunate to say that, but it's true. You know, we face a lot of microaggressions. Um, someone else says it, and then oh, okay, like our idea gets shot down. But I think that's what's so powerful about this time in history that we've seen so many women of color take on these these roles, and just the sad fact that only only two women who are Native American have served in Congress when we have a history of, uh, as a country that have, um, you know, marginalized Native American people have taken land, have not fully recognized tribal sovereignty, have not fully um, given that space and, and the credit where it's due. And it's, it's shameful that we still live in a country that um, holds people down and, and, that, and that's time for us as young people and it's time for candidates uh, to take on these, these roles um, because it, that we're the ones who are gonna shape the future. And that's why we got to elect people like you who are gonna be the voice and make the change and make the difference. And so that's, that's really what it's about for me. And that's why I've maintained uh, being involved even throughout law school, because it's not about like, it's not about accolades. It's not about awards. It's not about, um, you know, making myself think that I know everything. It's the fact that we should be working together, especially as women of color to hold each other up and they lift each other up as, as the future, but also as the present today that we are capable of making a difference. And we should be uh, doing things collectively to try to get our voices heard at a national stage. And that's really what it's about today. And I'm just happy to share that with, with all of you. And just like Brandy said, this is really kind of like a college reunion because um, Cindy graduated a year before I did an undergrad and we did have a class together. And, uh, and it's just kind of, it's beautiful that throughout the years I've seen her involved and I've seen her develop and flourish. And we've always you know, been supportive of one another and, and I think that that's a testament to our generation that it's not about, you know, who's better or, you know, it's not about competition. It's about embracing one another and helping each other. And that's what we all can do here today as women that we can be there to help lift each other when the time comes for whoever wants to run. And if we're not the ones who want to run, we're going to help those who do want to run. And that's what it's about. So thanks so much. Great, thank you. We can conclude now. <laughs> Cindy, do I turn it back to you? Okay, yes, great. I will, I will thank take you. it. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica, and thank you, Brandy. Um, it really does feel like a reunion, um, you know, and I think something that ties everything together, uh, Georgine, as well is, you know, acknowledging those privileges that we get to have, right, in one way or another. So just like Jessica shared, you know, she had the privilege of being born on this side, right? Her mother did not. So I fall into that story of her mother, right? So growing up with being undocumented, being politically engaged without being able to cast a vote until this day, as a matter of fact. Um, but working with women like both of you, um, you know, running a whole slate of candidates for ASUNM, it's truly ironic to now be here again, doing it in real life and getting you to be at the table to contribute to this discussion that we know is not highlighted enough to help women of color get into leadership positions, not only into the highest political range, but, you know, across across sectors. And how do we do that? And I think we look to people like you, Georgine, who are folks who are carrying those messages 
who can take this into the hallways of Congress and make sure that our voices are being heard. Voices like our families who cannot cast a vote, you know, voices of folks who can't, you know, who, who cannot do it for one reason or another. And I think you, Georgine, as a Native American woman, absolutely understand where we're coming from. So we're just so grateful. Um, and I know that we have a lot of questions to get through, um, but I wanted to see, to give you an opportunity, Georgine, to kind of, you know, provide some some insight on, on you know, for you, what it's been like as a Native woman coming from your lens, you know, what it's been like throughout your path and with those burdens and barriers. Yeah, thank you, Cindy. I mean, I think, you know, you are a testament, Brandy's a testament, Jessica's a testament, so many others are really doing everything that we can by hard work, by determination, by community, and by um, female mentors. Um, I know we have Dr. Gomez Chavez, you know, tuning in and, you know, it's, it's not just one of us. You know, Deb's been a great mentor. We've had so many great female mentors, women of color, that we can say, look at her. And she's accomplished a lot. And um, I, when they say, yes, how can I help you too? Because I also want you to accomplish a lot. I think that's been just incredibly inspiring. And um, I know I've had so many people in my life that have been able to um say, you know what, you had a daughter when you were a sophomore in high school and, and people said, you're gonna be a statistic and you're never gonna be a lawyer, forget about them. They don't matter. You know, they're, it, it just doesn't matter. Like it, what, believe what's in your heart, believe what's in your prayers and just work hard. And I think, you know, the, everyone that we have, not just on the panel, but like those folks joining us today, everyone shares that story where people have put us down or discarded us or said we don't belong in certain spaces or places or whatever it may be. Uh, I remember when I was a, a freshman legislator and I was in the House Lounge, the House of Representatives Lounge, and, and the Sergeant at Arms said, excuse me, this is for members only. And it's because people aren't used to seeing a brown woman in those places, in those spaces, and that's gonna change. <laughs> I know just with not only our, our panelists here today, but also the folks you know that are participating, thank you all for, for joining us because I truly believe that. I truly believe that every one of us and the work that we've been doing for years and years and, and um, what our kids, are seeing of us is truly going to make a difference. I think, you know, with, with Cindy and Brandy and Jessica, with, with you seeing what, you know, your family, your friends, your mentors have done, I think, you know, you guys now are, are leading these incredible journeys as well. So um, I just, I am super excited to see what is going to happen um, with our future generations, um, especially our, our women of color. Georgine, I think just touching on that, you mentioned being a mother at a very young age, right? And I know you've told this story before, but I think it's incredibly powerful to kind of take us back to that moment when you went and told your parents, you know, I'm pregnant um, and what they told you, if you wouldn't mind sharing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I, I tell this story uh, and this is really some of you know, going back to my core values about culture, clans, and community. And um, when I told my parents that I was pregnant, they said, you know, we can take care of your daughter. You can finish school. You can go and pursue college and everything you want to do. And, and we'll take care of her like she's our own. And, um, you know, I just, I didn't think that that was an option. I didn't like even say, okay, let me think about this. I, I just kind of said, no, um, this is my daughter. This is my responsibility. I think I, I, I was, I, I couldn't stand the not knowing. So I found out <laughs> she was a girl, um, but I, I just, I knew that that was 
just something I had to do. And I think um, a lot of women of color, you know, when we're put in those situations and sometimes there's, um, I don't want to say an out, but when, when, when we're put in these positions, we find a way to make things work. We, we, we look to our families, we look to our friends, we look to our communities and these people step up for us. And I, I, I guess I just kind of felt that I was going to have people step up for me, which, you know, my family was incredible. Friends were incredible. Teachers were incredible. So, um, yeah, and, and I would never, ever, ever, ever encourage a teenager to have a child, but I'm super blessed that um, it worked out for my daughter and, and me and, and um, we're so close and, and now I have these incredible grandchildren and I get to like throw them in the air and <laughs> play with them. So, so again, it's, it's community. Um, putting ourselves in community, you know, I, I hadn't met Brandy before. I've known Jessica for just a little bit, but, you know, now we're in a community together. And, 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 and again, you know, I, I, I'm super glad that you are both pursuing your passions and, and really building um, to be better um, in our communities, because that's what I strive to do. I strive to be better. And now, that we're a community, we can work together and, and, and again, really get stuff done. I have to say stuff. We're going to get stuff done. <laughs> I think adding on that, I want to, there's a question on the chat that I want to pose to all of you, if you don't mind. Um, so this one comes from Adriana um, and she's essentially asking what you will each do to open more doors for women of color who want to be involved. This is probably specifically to you, I think, Georgine, but I think we can have all of you address it just in general. So what will you do to make sure that you open more doors for women of color to be involved for Georgine in politics and for both of you, you know, in your respective areas? Um, Brandy. Well, I'm always looking for opportunities. I think when I think about my opportunities, it was literally somebody just sending me an email, right? Or just saying like, hey, I think this would be a great opportunity. So in my capacity, I'm always trying to meet students and understand what their passions are so that we can pass that information. More recently, I've been involved with the New Mexico Black Central Organizing Committee. And I see one of my sisters in here, Monet Silva. So, um, it, what has been really awesome about that is that it's been an intergenerational approach, right, of Black women creating policy um, to better the lives of, like, our Black community here in New Mexico. And so um, in that capacity, I really want to encourage more high school and college women to get involved in there. Um, and then hopefully they can get into other spaces like Emerge and other programs that will help develop them. Thank you, Brandy. That's awesome. Uh, Jessica. Yes, no, I, I, I kind of echo what Brandy um, is saying. I, I, I truly believe in mentorship. I, I'm a product of, of being mentored. You know, LULAC was a training ground. Again, you know, it's a nonprofit organization and, and you know, they do a lot of work um, in the community across the country. And they treated me like an equal. I was young and when I was National Youth President, I was like 16 years old. and all of them, men and women, they said, all right, here's the mic, go out there and you use your passion. And they would, they would just throw me in the situation and then they would guide me later. Okay, this is how you can improve. And I, and I think that it really built my confidence at the time because I was kind of a little bit more quiet and unsure. And I think that really helped me funnel my, my passion. And, and I, I give, you know, a lot of credit to you know, uh, even my mentors at the university as well. So like there's been mentors in LULAC, but also mentors in LULAC that followed me in, in the university, like Dr. Lawrence Roy Ball and Dr. Gomez Chavez. And then, you know, in LULAC, you know, uh, Josie Marujo and, 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 you know, Emilia Vasquez, Melanie Vigil, all these different people that have, you know, mentored me. I won't forget that. They've been with me since I was a kid. And so I wanna do that for someone else and not just someone, other students in general. Um, so definitely getting them involved in organizations, but you know, I, I plan on being a future lawyer here, you know, hopefully if I pass the bar in July, <laughs> knock on wood, um, if I you know, become a licensed attorney and someday if I do own my own practice or even if I don't, if I'm involved in 
a law firm, I would love to help, you know, be able to offer uh, clerkships or, you know, internships to different law students, you know, especially women of color. Um, and then in terms of politics, just, you know, getting people involved um, and being there to hold a hand and say like, hey, let's do this together and uh, not being afraid to talk to students and letting students know that, you know, you don't, we don't have to talk to them, talk down to them, you know, know that they have power now and that they can get involved now. And that, that's what was done for me. And I hope to do that for someone else in the future. And um, I just thank all my mentors for that. And Jessica, you had to say when you pass the bar. <laughs> yes. <laughs> when. Yes. We got yes. When, I, when I do. Yes. <laughs> Um, I'll have, we'll, we'll do a study exams, Jessica. <laughs> Note that. Uh, Georgine. So um, I actually love a couple of words. So Randy used intergenerational and then Jessica used equivalent. And, and, and before, I, before I talk about like, you know, what I want to do and, and what I've done, but I just want to say that, you know, again, going back to community and, and being from Acoma, so our, our, our words like, okay, so for my mom and my, my, my daughter, their, their name for one another is the owl, right? So to my daughter, it means grandmother. To my mother, it means granddaughter. And it's equivalent. So it's not you know, your grand, your younger, it's, this is our relationship or equivalent. So, so I, I, I love that you both said that because I think that's extremely important where we have to see one another's, one, each other's as equivalent. And, and yeah, perhaps someone might be older, someone might be more experienced, whatever. We're still equivalent in the fact that we have passions that uh, we have goals and that we're working together to achieve some of those goals. So, so in, in doing that, um, you know, when, uh, when I was a new lawyer, I would be a mentor to um, the students in law school. I, I think now that I'm able as a chairperson um, in the legislature to hire staff, I always look to hire women of color um, or, or, you know, just uh, other minorities. I hired a young black man uh, in, in during this session. So, I mean, just really, again, having people be in those places, in those spaces, where they can learn, where they can offer their insight is extremely important. Like I would love to, you know, have a, a bigger conversation with both Jessica and Brandy to, um, you know, just bounce off ideas. But I, I think, you know, really having that mindset of, of we're equals and when we work together again, we can get stuff done. So I hope to have, uh, if I win, once I win, <laughs> I don't want to get in trouble with Brandy. <laughs> um, you know, people of color, young young women on staff that I know can contribute greatly to serving New Mexico and, and doing everything we can to provide jobs, to provide access to healthcare, um, you know, provide early education opportunities, whatever we can, uh, because again, these are our voices of New Mexicans, and and I'm never gonna pretend to have all the answers. Um, and and so I will look to folks that um, have those lived experiences that can contribute to conversations. And um, you know, so it's I I I will open doors, but I hope to also learn from all of you too, um, because again. We need to have. We need to be in those positions uh, where we can have input on decisions that are being made about ourselves, our families, and our communities. Thank you, Georgine. Um, I think adding on what you all brought together, it was really interesting that you picked up those two words from them, and you made me think of something that I say all the time when I do speaking engagements or things as such. You know, I talk about this notion of being a positive interrupter. And I feel like those positive interrupters in our lives are those folks that essentially come in right as soon as we're having these hardships or when we're feeling down. And it's a lot of those mentors that we have. And Dr. Gomez Chavez, who's on the call, and Dr. Lawrence Roybal, I always talk to them about this notion of cross-generational mentorship. And I think that is 
that is an a it's essentially a space that I don't think is utilized enough, but I think it brings the most value in the world. And I think it's very much relatable to what the relationship that you mentioned, Georgina, of your mother and your and your daughter, you know, learning from one another, knowing what we knowing and, and acknowledging what we don't know, because we don't have all the answers. But when we come into a space like this with you panelists, with everyone joining us on the chat and on the on the event, um, then we create momentum. We put our voices together and walk together towards a broader movement that actually represents the people and the state that we are trying to, to represent. Um, so huge cross-generational mentorship advocate. I think it is one of the most beautiful things that we can do, um, regardless of whatever age we are, and you know, learn from one another because we never stop learning. Um, but thank you for that question, Adriana. Um, and we do have uh, questions from Jessica as well and Brandy that I want to get to. So uh, Brandy, if you want to kick it off with one of your questions. Can we go with Jessica first? I can pull the so Sure thing. Go ahead, Jessica. All right. Uh, one of my questions for you is what sense of purpose guides your life and as a leader? So, um, Again, you know, I, I, I hate to be repetitive, but it's, you know, that the, the three values that I always go back to that I was raised when I was, you know, this, this little res girl, uh, you know, just so, so full of questions and um, again, community, culture, and clans. And so when you're talking about those three things, those are really what have helped me, I feel, become, you know, successful. Um, so, so just if, if you haven't heard my spiel before, you know, uh, culture is really just the idea of, of praying for one another, for praying for everyone's prosperity, for everyone's safety, for everyone's well-being. Uh, clans is, is best represented by family. Um, just because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a member of the Pueblo of Acoma, and, and I definitely experienced this when I had my daughter is that you're always around family, you're not alone or without support. And, and, and last, but never ever least is community. And, and it reminds us that we're not individuals. We share each other's um, successes, we share each other's um, heartaches, you know, we're there for one another. So those things have, have really guided me. And I think when I, you know, when I think to being super blessed uh, by being able to finish high school on time and, and go to college and go to law school and, and become a lawyer, take that crazy bar exam and be a lawyer and, and be in, in these communities that I, I want to help. I, 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 I do feel that now that I, you know, I, I'm always trying to set goals, but at least that I've, 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 I've reached some of those goals, but I, I owe it back. Um, I owe it back to, to help others um, succeed, whether that's a lawyer and, and trying to help my client succeed or or whether that's a, a legislator and and trying to get my constituents help um especially during this pandemic i've had phone calls from constituents crying crying like i'm not kidding and and when we're able to assist them um it's it's tears again but it, it's tears of, of of gratefulness and it's it's not something i'm doing but it's just i'm helping them make those connections and so um, I, I just, that's what drives me. I, I, I think, you know, now that I'm in a position to help people, then that's what I want to do. Because I know that if I help one person, then that's going to help them help another person. And we're just going to build off, you know, this, this chain of community. We're supporting one another. We're working together. And like, you know, when, when we see that, working I, I just think it's such an incredible thing and 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 I love that um, we have people that are super passionate and and su super um, 
dedicated to like fighting the good fights and and figuring out how to get stuff done. So um, that's really what drives me. And yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> Thank you, Brandy. Thanks. Um, I had to rethink my question because initially I think I had um, I had talked about you know like what is uh, what is your top priority? But I think, you know, and just listening to you talk and recognizing that all of, all of these priorities are connected, right, in some way. Um, I'm just curious about what are perhaps most pressing priorities for you when you step into Congress? So definitely it's everything that has to do with COVID recovery, because unfortunately people are experiencing, you know, loss of jobs, loss of healthcare through no fault of their own. And um, that, that, you know, the financial stimulus has been great. And I think we need to continue that. I think we have to have help for small businesses, for, for our, our, our governments, our tribal governments, and just really being able to ensure that um, we're able to put food on the table and, and really be health, healthy and happy so that we can um, achieve those goals. So that's the immediate priority. Um, is really continuing on, on relief packages and ensuring that people are taken care of. Um, and then, you know, what's always been very um, close to my heart, even during my tenure in the state legislature is um, environmental issues. So combating climate change, um, really taking care of mother earth. Uh, again, just being from Acoma and having that instilled in, in my brain that we have to have a clean and healthy mother earth so that we're able to plant food and have, you know, healthy animals and have healthy people. So, so that's probably number two. And um, number one is, is I mean, excuse me, <laughs> number three is um, really, I don't want to be super broad, but it's, it's really building off everything that Deb started and running with it to ensure that all the work that she put into the last couple of years is not gonna, you know, fall down the wayside. And, and you know, there's, there's so many items, especially because she was one of the voices, the female voices for Native Americans and, and ensuring that tribes have the seat at the table that we're able to, um, educate folks about tribal sovereignty, about tribal self-determination, about, you know, the political status of Native Americans, and, and really working um, with colleagues across the aisle like she did. I think she was really great at that. You know, I think she had the most amount of legislation with, with Republicans. And, you know, I, I try to do that in the state legislature, and, and I'm one of the few Democrats that, you know, can reach out to the other side of the aisle and, and, and try to figure out where we have common interests so that we could move forward. So those are, those are some of the things, but like you said, it's, it's kind of, you know, all encompassing as well, because so many things depend on taking care of our people first and then kind of working our way up. Thank you, Georgine. Um, and I think so a huge umbrella that you've really led uh, throughout your time at the legislature as well has been, you know, fighting for working families, right? Fighting for women, fighting for the disadvantaged folks, you know, like many of us that come from, you know, low income families, um, those folks, but I think it comes from an experience, a lived experience that you've had that, that goes very deep. Um, and we do have another question um, on the chat box. Um, and I think all of us can very much relate to this. Uh, so thank you, Sheila. Um, and, you know, Sheila essentially is saying that even though, you know, she carries a leadership position and a master level education, she doesn't feel like she's being heard in this specific situation that she pointed out. And I think we as women of color are in those places and spaces all the time, um, unfortunately. And many times it's, you know, the higher you get into leadership, I feel, you know, the wider it gets mm -hmm. and the harder it gets for women of color to be taken seriously and to have an equal chance. So, I totally hear what Sheila is saying. I think it would be great to get some perspectives from um, all of you just in terms of advice or suggestions. Um, 
at least sort of from my angle, Sheila, I would say, you know, I've definitely been in that space and it's hard. It's hard mentally and it's hard <laughs> all the way around. Um, but I think having a close group of trusted allies that are there for you that you can reach out to, to talk through these things, that was one of those things that has saved me in those hardest moments, especially when you are, there, there's an age gap of the folks, you know, that you're essentially sharing leadership with or leadership positions. Um, and I think as people of color, as communities of color, we come from a cult from cultures that have mass respect for our elders. So those can be 10 times harder, which I think, you know, I, th I think is very relevant. So um, I would say to have that close network of allies that you can reach out to, have them, you know, support you on all those questions and help you walk through those thoughts. Um, and I'll toss it over to Jessica. Yeah, I definitely relate to that. And as a matter of fact, the other day I posted about my struggle with imposter syndrome throughout law school. I mean, not that I didn't face it before, because I, I did. But law school was a very unique, it's been a unique time for me in that like, you know, I, I've been involved in, in circles and spaces. I've, I've been given, you know, a chance to really lead in a lot of efforts, but law school was a completely different experience for me. Um, you know, there were some, you know, I'm not trying to name names or anything, but you, you know, I faced a lot of my progressions in law school um, where, you know, a lot of us, there, you know, would have conversation, a lot of women of color, we would have conversation afterwards and say like, hey, like, do you even feel like you're being heard? Do, does our perspective even count? You know, we would say like, oh, like the law doesn't even humanize these different issues or doesn't, you know, how can I be learning about, you know, specific legal concepts that are rooted in, in, in racism? It's just like, it, there, there's, it, it's, it's heavy. And then when we try to say something, oh, there's all of a sudden, and I, and I hate to say it this way, but there's a white student who's like, well, that's inaccurate. This is really what it's about. It's like, you know, no, like, you know, I have a voice, like, you know, take some time to respect my voice. <laughs> that's not what, you know, so anyway, so what I say is there came a time recently where I said, no, you know what? I'm no longer gonna have imposter syndrome. No one knows what the heck they're doing. They pretend that they do, but they don't. They're every, all of us are learning. And they're just better at masking their own insecurities than maybe I am. And so I feel like I know I have a lot to offer and my perspective is unique. That's what makes me me and I'm going to speak and I'm going to say what I have to say. And if they're not going to hear me, I will repeat it. And then I will, I will um, I'll also hold people accountable. I expect people to hold me accountable. So I hold them accountable as well and say like, hey, did you, I, did you hear what I said or like I try to do in a respectful way, but I'm also assertive. That's part of who I am and I'm, I'm very upfront. So I will, I, I have come to a point where I will just address how I feel. If I feel like I've experienced a microaggression, I will say it and I will let them know like, you know, I'm gonna be heard. Or if I see one of my colleagues um, also being kind of ignored, I will step in and say, hey, like, you know, so-and-so didn't get a chance to say their point. Like, I would like to hear what so-and-so had to say. And that way, you know, we can kind of put a check in this because sometimes this normalized behavior, you know, is, is problematic and, and people don't realize that they're doing it. So it's time to kind of help by addressing it and, and, and facing it head on. But then I think it's also time as women to just say, hey, like we're capable, we are powerful. And, you know, just like Deb started the movement, we are, you know, we are fierce. And I do think that Deb made a huge difference, not only as one of my mentors, but, um, you know, seeing how she held herself with such composure and strength throughout the whole confirmation uh, process. And especially because she was facing a lot of criticism, um, I, I had to hand it to her. And she was one of the main reasons why I kind of had that moment that defined me and said like, no, I'm, I'm gonna start being who I'm meant to be. And that is a person that's not gonna be um, placed down or meek and quiet. I am a person who's gonna be heard and I'm gonna make sure that my fellow women are heard as well. And I think that you should be heard as well. So if I can help you in any way, I am, I am ready to help. Thank you, Jessica. Brandy? I think my advice would be um, sometimes it's 
it's crucial to recognize the space, right? And if it's so toxic, sometimes you need to leave that space and find a new space. Um, and sometimes allies work to help build that space. But I read this book probably two years, two years ago called Crucial Conversations, and it has just helped me totally. So like the big thing is like backstory ask, right? So um, basically like when I'm feeling that people are not hearing me, I will talk to them just like Jessica said, and I'll say like, hey, Cindy, when I said, here's my fact, when I said, I have an idea about X, Y, and Z, and then you didn't listen to me or somebody else said it, then you tell your story, right? It seemed to me that you didn't care what I had to say, or it seemed to me that you were, you know, like minimizing my voice. Can you tell me like, if that's correct? So you ask them what just happened, right? And so like, even in as women, I think sometimes in these spaces, like we can be sexualized too, right? So like, oh, when you said that I looked really nice today, it made me think that like, you know, whatever, can you tell me like what you meant by that? And so it puts people on notice that like, I recognize what language that you're using and I'm not gonna tolerate that. Or I recognize um, the behavior that is happening and I won't tolerate it. And it puts people in and it's uncomfortable to be held accountable, right? But it also lets them know that like, that's something that you are recognizing and that you won't stand for. Thank you, Brandy. Georgine? Hi, Sheila. I'm so glad you can join and join us. Um, I, I, I love that question. I, I think it's great. And I, I thank both Jessica and Randy for your responses because I, I think you're right on. You know, I as a Pueblo woman working in like an area where it's it's Pueblo men or white men, you know, that's been huge for me. And I think especially when I was a baby lawyer, um, you know, my, my, my mentors, my white male lawyer mentors, I would say, don't let anyone ever, you know, tell you, you, you or say, you refer to you or think that you're the secretary or the paralegal, like make sure that you say, I'm Georgine Lewis and I'm a lawyer. And so I, I think, you know, kind of reminding people of, of who you are in your position. But in addition to that, you know, especially if people are hiring you, remind them, um, you're paying me <laughs> to give you, in my case, it's like legal advice. You're paying me to give you legal advice. And, you know, I, I've done the research, I, I've, I've looked at this, I've provided the options, I'm providing the recommendations. Um, if you're not going to follow me, I, I, or follow my advice, then, you know, I'm putting it out there. But, but I think, again, you know, what, what, what Jessica and Brand, or yeah, what Jessica and Brandy said, is like putting people on notice, like, again, unfortunately, <laughs> Uh, and maybe I'm giving people the, the benefit of the doubt is that sometimes they don't know they're doing that because no one calls them out on it. And, and if you say, you know, the way that you're talking to me, if, if people hear you, they can say that's inappropriate. Like, can we just like keep that out of this professional space? Um, if, 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 if you're not gonna, you know, take my advice or, or listen to what you're paying me to do, then do you need to revise the position so that, you know, I mean, really, again, just calling them out and questioning how you need for them to listen to you. Is it, do, do, do you know, maybe we're having miscommunication here. How can we talk about this and, and figure out what's the best approach to dealing with it next time? So, so again, just putting folks on notice, asking those questions, but doing it in a manner. Um, I, I, I literally had a, a state senator yelling at me the other day. Um, and, I, and I think that's super unprofessional. And, you know, I, I just said, you know, um, look, I, at first I thought he was kidding and, and I was like you're funny haha ha. and he's like no I'm really upset and I was like oh I didn't take you serious because that's not a professional way of doing things <laughs> so I thought you were kidding I'm sorry and again just like putting folks on notice like you know oh I'm sorry I thought you were kidding I because I just that's not the, the space we're in so so I, I think having those conversations but don't let it ever slide to the extent that you're wondering about it alone I think that's that's the worst thing um and and being aggressive and, and assertive is is okay because 
it's kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't sometimes. You're gonna be accused of, of not standing up for yourself or standing up for yourself too much. So as, as, as someone who is educated and experienced and, and really passionate about the work that you do, um, again, figure out, you know, and, 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 and I think um, Brandy said, you know, if, it, if, it's, if it's not working out, then um, find, find, find a different space. And, and find a space where you're appreciated and, and where you feel that um, your ideas and, and your education and everything that you stand for um, will move the organization forward. So um, happy to talk with you more, but I mean, I, I think it's something we've all experienced and I, and I, I like everyone's suggestion of just calling folks out. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome, Sheila. I think it's a very real response, right? And holding folks accountable. I think sometimes even some of our closest allies, you know, do things that make us uncomfortable. And sometimes we don't say, if we don't say it, it's not going to be heard. So I would reemphasize just accountability. And yes, seconding uh, Brandy, you know, when that space is so toxic, um, you should just walk, walk out. I mean, but also have an opportunity to talk and discuss it because just internalizing all of that does no good for us. And there's a lot that we have to hold, you know, when we're in these spaces of a whole lot of privilege and we don't come from privilege. Um, so it's, it's a learning game, I think, as women of color. Um, but also, you know, act on whatever it is, those goals that, that, you, that you're setting yourself to, you know, get involved, get active and get on boards, you know, get into these spaces that are not inherently made for us. And we will make people feel uncomfortable. That's just the blunt reality, but it's the time to make sure that we, our voices are being heard. And that's why we have to send Georgine to Congress to ensure that that voice that Deb created is not, does not go missing because Georgine, you essentially bring us a whole package and we very well know that. So I think, I think that's, that's just an additional one. I know we are over time, everyone, and we have everyone staying on board, but I think we should close up with this last question from, from, from uh, Fernando Ramos. He's asking, who are your role models? Um, so maybe we can talk about two role models for each one. So Jessica. Uh, hands down, my mother's my role model. Uh, she's the bravest person I absolutely have ever met. For her to come from her country without pretty much anything and not knowing the language, I think, and just she's such a strong, quiet person that like, I, I don't know anyone stronger than her. Hands down, she is my inspiration. So that's who, and, my, and I would say my grandmother's on uh, both sides as well. The women in my family, I mean, I have a lot of, of role models, you know, that are, are also male, but the women in my family generationally, their strength, I carry that and I'm proud to be a product of them. And they're the reason why I am who I am. And so I, I give them honor always in any space. Thank you, Jessica. And just to add, I forgot to include mine and I, that's, I have to, and it's my grandmother and my mother, um, my yaya, who was a woman with a third grade education, but you would have thought she had a PhD. And she always said, you know, just keep on going, Cindy, even at the times where people were like, you don't have papers, you won't be able to do anything, you know, just don't, don't get involved. Um, but I listened to my yaya, you know, just to keep going. And she is just in my heart, even though she's no longer with us. Um, and my mother's hard work, you know, as a woman who cleans houses for very wealthy people. Um, I listen and I learn from her dedication each and every day. And once in a while, I get to go clean those houses with her. Let me tell you about that. I'm not as effective of her as her, but so don't ask me to go clean your house because it's not going to work out <laughs> so well. But yes, agreeing right there, seconding you, Jessica. Oh, Brandy. Same. Um, my grandmother was also a domestic worker who cleaned houses and um, took me to the polling locations on the weekends, you know, and so, and then my mom was an educator. So um, my mom's working on her master's right now and like has five kids and like is just like killing it. So yeah, I just think women in our lives are just phenomenal. I love that we can hear your son in the background too, Brent. <laughs> You know, um, yeah, for me, it's, it's been those female people in my life, my mom and my grandmothers. Um, my mom was 
a homemaker. She paints pottery. Um, you know, she didn't really ever work, but I think a role model is having someone who loves you unconditionally. And um, that's been her and, and my grandparents as well, my, my grandmothers, you know, seeing everything they do for our families um, makes me want to work harder. So I, 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 I love that um, I've been loved by them. And um, I, I really feel that that makes a huge difference in a child's life. So um, yeah, I, those, those, those who, those are the people that inspire me apart from all others, but there's been so many people also men and women and other family members, other friends, and, and even folks that have um, had little contact. Um, so I, I just, I think that's why community is so important is because when we feel loved and appreciated and accepted, then we can offer that to other people. And so um, that's why it's extremely important to have this discussion. Thank you, Cindy, for organizing. Thank you, Brandy and Jessica, for joining us because it, it's important to have these conversations about how we fit in when we feel that we're being pushed out. And when we have the role models, I think that's a great way to end it is that when we have these, these role models that have shown us love and courage and, and compassion, and it, it makes us stronger. And, you know, I'm barely five feet, but sometimes I feel like I'm super tall because of all the love that people have given to me. And, and I really appreciate everyone that has stayed on. I think we haven't lost anyone, but, you know, just having a fantastic team and, and I look forward to building it even more and to building those pipelines and those steps so that other people can can join us like i'm never going to be the person to say you don't belong here um because we're all human and um we all want to do great things so i will help any way i can and 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 thank you everyone for joining us thank you for your tremendously um fantastic support and um i i i, I Pray and I, I'll keep you in my prayers that you and your families uh, remain safe or um, if, if not that you, folks are, are getting better, especially after um, everything we're dealing with with COVID. But um, thank you. I will keep all of you in my prayers. And um, yeah, I, I just can't say thank you enough. I, I keep wanting to say thank you, thank you, thank you. So so, Jane, so you're forgetting you're forgetting a very important thing though please support us please, please, please support join us. the campaign please contribute if you can i have this is a duty y'all i have to do make the ask I hire these folks <laughs> <laughs> yes no i mean it's because we had a real conversation that's the big difference here and that's the reality and i think that's the beauty of of who you are and you essentially show these folks where you come from what you're made up of and you know that's why we're with you Georgine so again if anybody is interested in getting involved please on the chat we have the information our email um you know check out the website reach out to us uh we would love to have you join us I know we have a lot of strong supporters here I know we have Gabe um on there who is with the campaign as well and you know and we have a great fantastic man ally on on the line with us Alejandro Mendia so when Georgine tells you she will never turn her back on you she is not joking okay she her campaign walks the talk she walks the talk as a human and as a candidate and she would make one hell of a congresswoman so we hope that we can count with your support um brandy jessica thank you so much um thank you for all your work and your leadership and i just we we look forward to collaborating and, and doing greater things with you all together um i don't know if you want to give give some closing words ladies Uh, I want to thank you. I just texted Alejandro and said, I don't have a lot of time, but let me know how I can be of assistance. So Georgine, just this conversation alone, uh, you know, allowed me to like just lean in more. So I would love to be supportive in any way. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Yes, and just again, I'm grateful to be a part of this conversation and thank you all for staying on and listening to us and um, sharing with us um, 
any questions, great questions, and let me know how I can be of service. Thank you. So thank you again, everyone that joined us tonight. We're going to have more of these. Cindy, Alejandro, Alexa, Jason, you know, our entire team and so many volunteers are putting in so much work and I do appreciate it. Um, we're we're going to win this. We're going to win it um, for New Mexico. We're going to win it for Indian country. We're going to win it for people of color. We're going to, you know, just you, so we can open up more doors and 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 really lend our voice because our voice is is, is super important. And so thanks to all of you. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Good night.